I moderate myself, forgive me. I'm a wonderful speaker, welcome. <laughs> Just a second, there we go. Sorry? Yes, I understand. Don't, says my wife, you will figure out what that's about. Um, actually, I can tell you what it's about already and intrigue you about it. We're in Berlin at historic times. 25 years of wall here, the wall came down. And important things have occurred. One of them is that all East Germans and West Germans are now free to travel, you're free to travel, and so you can enjoy the specialty of Berlin. And here's the specialty of Berlin. It's the currywurst with french fries. And uh, we'll, we will get to the specialty in a second. And I will have not thrown it down. You happy, my dear wife? Thank you. Yeah, well, if you, if you ask the right question, you may be able to eat it. I don't know yet. Okay, I don't know how this works yet, but this looks good. Okay, well, um, this has been rather sobering. Um, I was hoping more of a, yes, we can, but I'll try to do the yes, we can. <laughs> um, I, I um, you know, grew up in Germany, and I thought there, you know, would be as many Germans, we thought, uh, you know, nuclear power wasn't so cool because in 1986 there was Chernobyl, and my mother actually, interestingly enough, lost five of her friends who lived in Hesha, and five of her friends who lived in rheinland palatinate did not die. What was the difference? The difference was that the government of Hesha at the time decided that the, uh, there was a nuclear cloud and kids should not play on grass and in, 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 in sand pitches. And across the Rhine, where I grew up in Mainz, the government decided that there was a nuclear cloud, or the other way around, sorry. And therefore, just 100 meters across the Rhine, the, the cloud apparently stopped with the effect that the kindergartens where my mother's friends were from in Wiesbaden were all open and ours were closed. And as a result, five of her friends from grammar school have all died of cancer and the five friends of the same group in 100 meters away are still alive. So we thought that you know, fighting nuclear was a good idea and was fun. And I quickly found out that it wasn't very effective because I kept getting carried away. So it didn't really work. So. So I thought, okay, I will try to become one of those suits and make a billion and then come back. So I uh, studied mathematics and economics and physics and uh, joined Deutsche Bank and became very wealthy and uh, tried to earn a lot of money and then do goods with it. But recently an amazing thing happened. I came across uh, Alan MacArthur and McKinsey and they said it's actually possible to do good and make money at the same time. And that's uh, what I would like to talk to you about today. Um, this is a, a, a graph that briefly puts together the concept of impact investing as I got it most of all. You have a, a horizontal line that says everything above you make money, everything below you lose money. A vertical line, everything to your right, you have a positive impact and a left you have a negative impact. On the bottom right you have the philanthropy people, people that have made some money, they don't mind if they lose it, they give it to support a you know, rape victim shelter. Uh, on the left, you've got guys who uh, try to make money, but they actually lost money, and they destroyed the environment. They're just unlucky. Top quarter, you have most of the people in the world who are investing money, killing uh, species, uh, using child labor, and so forth. And I thought, why, why not be conscious in the right top quarter where we have a positive impact and we have positive returns? And the negative thing about impacts investments reputation is that people think, oh, it's like philanthropy plus 1% returns. We hope to prove with the Green Gateway Fund and start a global movement where hundreds of billions of dollars will go in this direction, and where in the end of the day, all investments, like for the World Bank and the IFC today, will be impact investments by showing to the world we can make 20, 35% returns on these sort of investments that we're pursuing. Um, the basis of this is that, unfortunately, in 2000, 2001, there was a boom of investing in clean tech, and lots of people lost lots of money because they invested in climate change abating technologies on the right side of this McKinsey CO2 abatement curve, where you have to pay money, you have to subsidize solar power, you have to pay money to do something. But in fact, there are almost as many technologies, and thanks to the companies in this room, they're steadily growing the number of technologies, where you make money today by implementing them. If you have LED lamps in a room, you make money right away. And Guess what? With solar power today, never mind what you hear from the press, we are now below grid parity, which means it's cheaper for people to produce solar power than to take grid from oil, gas, and coal, uh, electricity from oil, gas, and coal-powered grid, which means in the world today we have more production of renewable power capacity being installed every year 
than the traditional one, and it's the end of the uh, carbon age in that sense already, simply because economics, it's cheaper. In Germany, the propaganda says, renewables make it expensive, we gotta stop renewables. It's nonsense, renewables now cost something like nine cents per kilowatt hour. It's very cheap in cold Germany. Yesterday it was very rainy, today it's very sunny, so you can see why in Germany we were at 75% renewable power uh, last summer, for example. Um, we decided to set up a fund uh, with some of the money we made, thanks to a partnership with Katastan. The capital of Katastan is Kazan, which is famous for Rubin Kazan, the first team to ever beat Barcelona before they were beaten by others. And uh, what the fund does is we invest in the EU resource efficient companies because here the energy consumption, resource consumption is generally um, uh, a, qu a quarter of what is the case in Russia or China or other emerging markets. By the way, uh, the map is almost perfect. The, uh, Switzerland is no longer on because they voted against free movement of people, but Israel is now part of it where we're allowed to invest and so is Norway. So there we are. Uh, we help these EU companies through the gateway of Kazan, which is a very open trading center. We will get uh, Valeri to present a former Hansestadt, a path between China and the Western world, a trading spot, to go to Eastern Europe, but also to grow globally. The fund offers investors downside protection, and because we're addressing global trends, we have an amazing return outlook, where we will hope to make three times our money, at least two times our money. The question is, does that make any sense or should we be scared investing in such a fund? Investment bankers will tell you, or bankers will tell you, you should do what we know what to do, we do what we've always done. You invest in conservative German utilities, for example. They give you a safe uh, cash flow and of course we have E.ON in the room, so I shall be polite, to, or EVE in the room, so I'll be polite. But the, uh, the, the truth is that the conservative, typical investment advice of 2008 by German utilities will have meant an investor will have lost 75% of their investment. So what used to be a, a stalwart of solid German investment has been wiped out. What you can also see here is the S&P, uh, um, German utilities having crashed, Germany having been more or less stable, and the oil and gas index still being very much up there. And uh, why am I talking about this terrible situation? because people are saying investing in new funds like the Green Gateway Funds, investing in renewable resource efficiency is dangerous unknown, and you should do what's conservative and known to you. But in fact, I believe this is not conservative, it's very, very dangerous to do. And as I mentioned before, um, there is a great movement now, which is the Divest Invest movement, where the Rockefeller brothers, who of course made their money on oil and gas, have committed, as many other people, to divest from fossil fuels. And what Al Gore has told the audience around the world is that we're really at risk of another bubble, and a bubble larger than the mortgage bubble. And the way he describes the mortgage bubble is that he has a nice picture of a strip dancer, which my wife said I shouldn't put on the screen. Nice strip dancer that, uh, no, okay, she didn't say that, that, uh, that was getting three mortgages free of charge without having any income. That was the mortgage bubble, and that was, uh, something like $13 trillion. The bubble of carbon assets is now $21 trillion and it's growing by a trillion a year. Why is it a bubble? It's a bubble because we cannot burn the fossil fuels that is in the ground. We will get too hot a temperature. But not only that, we now have products which, um, which make it uncompetitive. And this gets me um, to my curry and chips situation if I manage. So you will probably think, this is a crazy statement. How can, uh, how can we get rid of carbon assets and carbon fuels? Don't we need oil and gas? And the truth is, yes, we need oil and gas. So for example, for this wonderful curry, sausage, and, uh, and chips, you need lots of oil in the first place to grow the cows. The cows need to be fed uh, feed. To feed the cows, you need pesticides. Then you need to process the cow, transport the cow, fry the stuff, and so forth. And so a research done by Ted Talker, Mr. Pullen, indicated that the amount of oil that goes into this nice curry sausage today is reflected as follows. So first you have a, a wonderful glass of oil for the pesticides. And there we go. That's the first one, that's just to uh, have some pesticides, otherwise we can't grow the corn on which we're gonna feed the cow. And then, uh, 
you of course have to uh, process the cow and can't just uh, you know, let it sit there. That's going to be expensive. And finally, just a little bit more to get the cow onto my table here. There we are. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's your currywurst and, uh, and french fries. And uh, the question is, of course, well, if we have so much oil and stuff in our food, what's going to happen if we're going to run out of oil? And uh, the problem is we are running out of oil in some sense. Uh, the king of Saudi Arabia has said in 14 years' time we'll be net importers of oil unless they change. In 14 years' time, Saudi Arabia will be importing oil. If they do that, guess what happens to the price of my curry sausage here? And guess what happens to the societies we live in? We'll have poverty, we'll have wars, it's horrible. Therefore, even the king of Saudi Arabia has decided things will change. And they will not change because we run out of oil. They will change, he says, because of new technologies, and some of the companies in this room here will show how that works. He says the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stones. The Stone Age went, ended well before we ran out of stones. We have new technologies. And here's the man that inspired me on this path. Comes us back to Russian genius. In 2000, I had happily made a lot of money working for Deutsche Bank. I didn't know what to do in life. And I came across a man called uh, Alexander Prokhorov. Um, Alexander Prokhorov, at that time, was 83, I think. And uh, he said, well, you have some money. Why don't you invest it in something that will change the world? You know math, you know economics, you know physics. You can become a private equity guy that takes uh, Ben & Jerry's or Starbucks from London and puts it to Moscow, and you make a lot of money. Well done. That's not what you should be doing. You should think of something you can change the world. Here's a technology chain where you can produce solar-grade silicon at one-tenth the price, whatever it is in the market today. And indeed, when that happened in 2000, everybody says, that's crazy, it's impossible, don't even talk to this guy, he's nuts. I went to see Mr. Schröder, Mr. Prodi, they thought, well, interesting, not sure it will work. Of course, you know the truth since then, the cost of solar has gone down so much that it's now possible to produce this wonderful uh, uh, curry sausage here without any of the oil, because as you probably know, if you just put anything in the ground and you have some sun, it will grow. You don't need any of this oil. We can do it without. So he inspired me to be here today. And in some sense, I'm very, very excited to be here today with you because for 14 years, I've been waiting for this day where I can say we have we'll put our money behind companies that will get us off oil and gas and to a sustainable future in a profitable fashion. We have seen with growth more energy consumed, with growth more CO2, with growth higher risks in the whole world the last 25 years, with one exception, and we're back to the currywurst. The currywurst is made as the only place on Earth in an energy-efficient way today. Germany has been able to grow strongly in GDP terms, consume less energy, and consume less CO2 emissions. And that's what we try to do with the Green Gateway Fund, find the companies in Germany and the Holland and the EU that deliver, deliver growth with less CO2 and less energy consumption that make money doing this. And uh, there's a study called the Hidden Champion Study, which talks about the 1,500 companies in the world that are really leaders in the market segment. One first, second, or third place, less than three billion turnover, and nobody knows them. It turns out that 1,500 of these companies are actually based in Germany, uh, Switzerland, Austria, and I don't have Holland on there, I'm very sorry, but we're also very Holland-focused and consider it's really part of it. So taking these small, medium-sized enterprises and bringing them to countries where they like to operate is what we do. Uh, the region of Tatarstan in Russia has managed to get the big companies there, as Siemens and Boeing can do business with Russia, but small, medium enterprises have a harder time, and we help them because that will make a difference, be it in Russia, be it in China, and around the world. And we're very happy that it's been done. Um, what we do is we invest in EU resource-efficient companies. We help them to grow globally. We offer downside protection. And with this fund and this great success, we hope to trigger billions to follow. And Caspar uh, asked me to take the last slide out because he will uh, talk to you about the revenue and success of the companies. But the last slide really would have said the revenues gross for the portfolio companies have doubled in two years. And for next year, they have tripled. And that's amazing yeah, because obviously it was very scary and many of the companies had many problems along the way. But now we're on track for tripling our revenues for this fund. So it's going very well. What we thought was fantasy has actually worked out. And we're very glad we're who we are. 
Thank you.